Hello, I'm Peter Keegan and I'm here to demonstrate for you today an example of how you go about creating a charcoal portrait. My model day is going to be a young boy about the age of uh, 10, 11 years old and I'm going to show you the whole process of how you start off the initial drawing, building up the tones, really focusing on how the light and the shadow form that face to make something three-dimensional and then going on how to really refine the details of that portrait. So specifically looking at those eyes, nose and mouth, making it very, very clear. The overall aim is to create a charcoal drawing that not just looks uh, like the person that we're trying to capture but really kind of feels like them and capture that sort of essence and that personality of the person to create a really wonderful drawing. The way that I start the portrait is it's important to always have a goal in mind, always have the aim in your head of what it is you're trying to produce. So having that aim at the very start before you even put the marking on the paper helps you achieve that. If you have that goal in mind, you're more likely to achieve it at the very end. So establish your goal early on. Now for me, what I want to really try and capture with this image is that really intense stare that that boy has. He's really, really fair haired and lovely fair skin. So I'm going to be using white chalk as well as the charcoal just to really uh, emphasize his uh, fair nature as well. And also to capture sort of the, the strong youth of, of, of the young boy as well. I'm using um, an iPad um, as my reference image, which is wonderful because I can zoom in and it can really, really change the qualities and it's going to help me render the drawing up as accurate as I possibly can. So, where do we start? Uh, I find that the best way to start, once I've established my goal, is I use my hand. Now, my hand I use as my measuring tool. Now, I'm not going to copy the image from left to right and make it actually the size of the iPad, because if I did that, the head would be quite small. I want to try and make my, my portrait, my head, as life-size as possible. Now, there's a good reason for that. The reason to make it as life-size as you can is that it feels more real when it's complete. Once you finish the drawing, if it's as life-size as possible, it's more convincing and it feels like you've really captured the person. The smaller the drawing, the portrait, head that you create, the actually the harder it is to really make it convincing and it's just very very difficult to do. The bigger the head, the actually the easier it is. So whenever you go and approach this method or any method for doing a portrait, try and make it as life-size or bigger as possible. Now there's a really good trick to help you get your portrait life-size and I use my hand, the span of my hand. Now I'm going to use the longest span that I create from my hand, which is from the bottom of my thumb to the top of my longest finger. Now the reason I use that dimension, that width, is because that dimension, that width, is the same distance from the bottom of your chin to the top of your forehead. Now, if you don't believe me, you can try that now, and that's from the bottom of the head to the top of your forehead. And that gives you that life-size dimension. Now, by using that example, I'm going to use that mark, and that's going to give me a rough life-size uh, dimension and, and width of this boy's head. So the bottom of my thumb here, that's going to be the base of his chin. So I'm just going to put just a little light mark with the charcoal for the bottom of the chin. And the top of my longest finger, which is my middle finger, is going to be the top of his forehead. So a light mark there. Now that's the top of his forehead, not the top of the hair, but the forehead. So that's typically where the hairline is or where the skull just starts to sort of recede and go back. So those are my two most important marks. So I can start now structuring the rest of the head. The next mark I'm going to place is the central face axis. Now the central face axis is the line that runs through the centre of your face, down your nose, through your lips, your chin and your Adam's apple. If you imagine that my head was a rugby ball, it would be the stitches that kind of bring it all together, so it's that middle stitch. Now if we look at the image of the boy, it's a slightly curve, there's an arc because it runs through his head, going down through his nose, his lips, chin, and down to his neck. So it has this nice sort of arc, this nice curve. Now I need to try and get this arc and this curve onto the charcoal. Now I'm using my charcoal really lightly. I don't really want to push down hard at all, and I'm just imagining that nice central face axis. And I'm running through that top line and for that bottom line, okay? So it just gives me a good shape and understanding of where that is. Now you can do the lines as many times as you like, and by placing that charcoal really lightly, if you do make a mark, you think, oh, that, uh, that mark is not right, you just run your finger over it and that charcoal will just disappear. So there's your central face axis. Now the next line I'm going to do is my eye axis. Now that's the line that runs through the two pupils. You have to imagine a line crossing your face going through those two eyes. Now depending on the angle of the head, that will depend upon the angle in which that you draw the eyes. Now with the image that I've got here, there's a slight angle, it's slightly leaning down to the left hand side, so I have to kind of make sure that I do that. I'm, I'm just going to hold up my uh, charcoal 
stick with my hand and that's just going to help me really understand that angle so it's not straight it's just slightly tilting down to that left hand side and I need to then try and correspond that and put this on this central line now the eyes typically are just above halfway between the bottom of the chin and the top of that forehead. So the eye line is not quite in the middle, which is what ten people tend to think and assume. The central face, uh, the eyes are not quite on that line. They're just above the centre. So in between these two lines, if I was to get, that's roughly the centre of the top of the head and the bottom of the chin. Where you're looking for the eye line is just above. Now this is, that's a general rule, sometimes that does change uh, for the person that you're drawing, but in this case that's pretty spot on. So I'm going to do that lovely light line, and that is where the eye line is, that's my eye axis. The next line I'm going to do is the nose axis, so that's the, uh, the line that runs through the nose, almost running through the two nostrils. Uh, when you do the nose, always try and make the nose a little bit shorter than you might think it is because the vertical on your face, you always make it uh, and draw it longer than it actually is. Now the nose is actually very, very close to the eyes and if you don't believe that, the reference image that you're using, a good tip is to turn it on its side, turn it in a landscape and just, just check how close that nose is to the eyes and you'll actually realise it's actually very, very close leaving a big gap from the nose to the chin and the eyes and to the forehead. There's a much bigger gap there than there is that middle bit. So when you sketch that nose, make sure you're not putting it all the way down the face, drawing the face longer than it needs to be. So, and for this point, I think, I think the nose axis, which is again that line running through the two nose, I think is roughly there. Now notice that I use the word think and roughly, this is all very at the moment, just guesswork, I'm just plotting very, very gently where I think the, uh, the proportions are. Now the next uh, line I'm going to do is the mouth axis, which is the line that runs through the two, where the two lips come together, creating that lovely line in the middle, and I think the mouth axis is roughly there. Now there's a slight curve going up onto the right hand side. And I think roughly structurally that's a good starting point for this uh, charcoal drawing. So what I call, I call this stage the, um, the, the skeleton stage. Now all of the marks that I'm going to put on top, all of the lovely big shading charcoal and all the chalk is going to sit upon this structure, this skeleton structure. And I want this foundation to be very, very strong. So it's worth spending a good amount of time making sure that you're really happy with the basic structure of this. Now that doesn't mean to say that it has to be perfect at this stage. As you're uh, continuing with the drawing, if you find that actually the eyes need to come down a little bit lower, or the nose needs to come higher, or the chin lower or higher, that's absolutely fine. You can move it a little bit, but it is really worth spending a good amount of time making sure that this is as strong and as accurate to the image that you're working with as possible. So where do we go from here? Once you've got your structure, we need to start finding the rough shape of that face. Now what I do is I start to plot in the outline shape of the face and using straight lines only. Now there's a good reason for this. It's very easy to go straight into curves and want to do the curve of the shape of the face and the chin and the hair. But by doing curves, you, you might start getting into trouble very, very quickly. And that uh, when one draws curves, you start to sort of pick up detail at this early stage. Now we don't want to worry about detail at this early stage, we want to sort of block it in very, very roughly. So just using straight lines, you want to find the rough shape of the head and you want to ignore any curves or um, round features on the face and just see them as nice straight lines and block those in. Now let me show you how we'll go about doing this. So if I was to start looking at the um, some light nice straight lines of the face, if I start on this outside uh, line here, I'm going to look at this line going across the outside and very, very lightly, I'm sort of going to block in a nice straight line there. So that's the outside of his face and then we're going to sort of put a nice straight line going down here which is then naturally going to take us to the bottom of the chin. Now working across from the chin I'm going to sort of build it up on this side which is his jawline and working systematically I'm not going to sort of jump straight up to the hair I'm going to carry on with this jawline I'm going to sort of start going up and where I'm going to sort of meet a rough sort of shape of where that ear line is and then I'm going to sort of then go up and I'm going to go inside the hair I'm not going to draw outside the hair just yet I'm just going to imagine there's a straight line for the hairline going across to the hair and then I'm going to meet up roughly back to the top part of the head. Now once we've got a rough inside of the head we've got to start thinking about where the rest of the face is. So we've got a rough shape of where this hairline is, so I've got the rough lovely straight line coming up here, coming up here, 
and that just gives you a rough structure of, of the hairline. And it's really important as well to give um, a neck and a pair of shoulders for the head to sit on. If you just do the head with no neck or shoulders, that head is just going to seem floating and just a little bit unstable. So by giving a neck and shoulder line or even a bit of a collar or shirt, that just really helps give that um, head something to sit on and just appear really kind of structured. Now a common, common error is that we do the neck and the collar way low down. So sometimes people draw it as far down as there. Again, the neck being a vertical, we always make it and exaggerate it. Quite often we find the neck and the collar is a lot higher up, it's actually very close to our ears. So again, looking at this, we can see the collar line is actually very, very close to his ear, which is roughly sort of there. And if you uh, find that quite difficult to, um, uh, to uh, understand and measure, if you just sort of get something straight like this pencil, and if by holding up the uh, line, I'm looking at the angle and the line of where the corner of his collar meets and just drawing an imaginary line across this image and I can see that it's just under his nostril nose. So if I put this line originally which is under uh, which is the nose line that I drew earlier I know that his collar line starts there and then it roughly goes down there. Now if I do the same with where his shoulder line is by holding up this pencil I can see that the shoulder line point which is there starts pretty much just under the chin which is about by there, and that's where his shoulder comes down. So it tends to be a lot higher than we think, but as you advance and develop the portrait, you'll see that's how it fits in quite nicely. Um, so let's just plot in where his neck roughly is, an outside collar mark, and we've got a rough sort of structure there. Now, don't worry if you think at this stage that it looks a little bit out of proportion and it's not quite working. You've got to stick with it. Again, this is not exactly how it's going to be. You'll refine it, you're going to cut into it, it might end up being slightly smaller, slightly bigger. That's the process. It's not about getting it right first time. If you think you're going to get it right first time, you're going to get into real difficulties. So start broad, start very lightly with that charcoal, and we're going to work at it slowly, refining it until we get to the image that you're really looking to create. So. Once we sort of define the rough structure of the outside of the head, we want to start finding some of those facial features. Using the same method, straight lines only, don't go into sort of drawing oval for the eyes, just find some of those lines across the face and get those structured in. Another good thing to look for, particularly in those facial features, are shadow lines. Now that's not just the lines created by sort of wrinkles and creases, but it's where the light and the dark kind of come together and they almost produce a sort of a line of shadow. So if I look at this, uh, for example, the cheek here, if I'm squinting at this image, so I'm eradicating all the details, so just by squinting your eyes, I can almost see that there is a line that cuts across this cheek. Now that's a really important line for you to make a mark on your image because that's going to help you structure where that light and that shadow is going to be. So as well as that, try and find some of the structure of the faces, uh, the facial details as well. So for example, there's a lovely shadow line going down the centre of this boy's nose. So I'm going to get that line in, that's a really useful line and mark to go, as well as the line being on the other side, which is the other side of his nose. And that's going to be curving up towards where the eye line is. And the same for this one as well. Now bear in mind I want to keep with that eye line. I'm noticing maybe my eye line is going to come down slightly lower where I originally placed it, which is fine. And let's just find the structure of that nose, the base of the nose there. And there's a lovely bit of shadow just on the left hand side of the nose that's curving into the cheek. That's a really useful little mark to place down there. Going up to his eyebrow. And again, there's this great shadow mark just coming up uh, his head, which is uh, just above the eye on the left hand side. There's a lovely kind of mark and shadow line there. Let's go back down from the nose now, and that's going to then hopefully join up with his mouth. Under his nose is filtrum, which is that sort of bridge the top lip. There's a very, very faint mark there. And I'm just going to place where his upper lip is, which is fa placed fairly spot on where I placed my original uh, drawing line, which is reassuring to know. And then there's a lovely shadow line creased by the edge of his mouth going down to here and here. Now I've neglected that right eye, so let's get that in. Going up here, there's that lovely shadow mark just under there. And then I can just roughly structure where I think that sort of eye shape is going down. Just take a little step back just to get a bit of distance from it. And I'm just going to sort of slightly bring in the chin just down there just a little bit. So I think it just needs to come in a fraction. Right, so I'm just now going to place this left eye just a little strongly, just a bit more uh, so I can see that it is a bit clearer coming up to there, the rough sort of shape there, and I'm just sort of going to actually shade that in quite quickly just so I can sort of see where that shadow line is, which is fine. 
Might have to creep over to the right a little bit later. We'll have to see how that goes. The eye coming there. And I'm just going to bring in the angle of this uh, top part of his face in just a bit more. That comes up a little bit more there. So you're being just a little bit more focused, just a little bit more studying. And you're going to be checking distances all the time. That's going to be the real crucial element. And the question that I often get asked the most is, you know, how do you get a likeness? And to get a likeness, there's unfortunately no easy answer that I can give you straight away. It's just going to take a lot of observation and a lot of patience on your part just to really check the distances from those facial features. That's going to be the most crucial thing. There's a couple little tips that you can do for that. Okay, constantly have your eye moving around the image as much as you can. Try and keep that eye really, really busy. If you just keep focusing just on one little specific area like this, you're going to get too focused on that and then you, you're going to get caught into a trap where you might end up drawing the proportions slightly wrong because you're so engrossed in that one little area. You should be sort of darting about a little bit. And by your eye moving about the image as a whole, as opposed to working individually, you're going to notice that parts of the features need to move up and down and left and right and ultimately you'll be getting the, st the correct structure and then the correct likeness of the person that you're trying to create. So try and have your eye moving around the page as much as you possibly can. Taking good steps back is really important. That almost gives you distance as well. Okay, You'll notice that I'm working upright, which is really important. If I was working flat, it would set change the dimensions. I'd fall, fall short in the image. So by having it upright, I can sort of see how it's going to look. Also, if the painting or drawing is going to end up being hung on the wall, I can see exactly what that will look like when it is hung on the wall. If it was flat, that's not how we view art when we have it in our houses and homes. We always have it upright. It almost gives you an immediate impression of how it looks and how it feels when it's viewed upright as well. And it gives you an opportunity to stand up when you're working this way, so you can sort of t take a step back and really, really judge what you're doing from a distance just to make sure um, how it looks. Because again, when we're drawing and painting, sometimes we get very, very close and we're very engrossed in the image. But of course, when we view art, we're always a good metre or so away from that image. So always work and take a step back just to get that distance. And then you should start noticing some features that need to be moving about. So some good little tips there just to help you gain that likeness and to get some distance from your image. So I've got a rough sort of structure of this face. Now I can start to sort of feel it coming and I'm sort of edging very, very closely to, uh, to the next stage and we sort of blocking into sort of my tone. So I'm just going to find a few more lines just to sort of place this ear, um, which I'm fairly happy with. And then I think that the hair's just gone a little bit too high on this left hand side. So I just know it just needs to come down just a fraction here. And I'm not worrying about erasing any of these marks. It's quite nice um, when you'll see the final drawing to have some of these initial sketchy marks. It sort of gives the uh, drawing a very fresh, uh, very lively feel. It's not overworked, it's not very, very fussy and stuffy. So it's kind of nice to sort of keep some of those marks. And because I've been working with the charcoal so lightly, it doesn't really require any rubbing out. You can just rub your finger over it and it gets nice and clean. And as you notice, I'm not getting messy at all. People have this misunderstanding that charcoal could be very messy, but you can see from my fingers there's hardly any dust on that at all. It's kept nice and clean. Of course, you don't have to use your fingers. If you just want to use a, a piece of cloth or a rag or something or a tissue, you can use that and that'll just take away the worst of the, uh, the dust on the, um, of that charcoal. So I'm just doing a few more just checks uh, structurally across there. I'm squinting a lot. You can't see this camera, but I'm actually squinting and looking at the image with, with closed eyes, and that just takes away a lot of the detail. And I can really just focus on just areas of tone, planes of tone, planes of light and dark, and it really helps me identify where those lines of shadow. So it's a good example here for the hair. You might find it difficult to find and identify those chunks of tone for the hair, but if you by squinting and really just getting rid of all those details, all those hair lines going everywhere, you can just see that there's a chunk of tone on this side, and then coming up here, there's a mid-tone by here, and then up by here we've got this section. This is a dark tone there. So by squinting, you can really kind of see those areas of detail. I think I'm going to slightly sort of narrow his face just a little bit more. So I'm just going to sort of bring his jawline in just a fraction there. Uh, I think consequently this uh, line of his um, collar is just going to come in a fraction there. So I've just taken it in about sort of a centimetre, about a quarter of an inch, just the way. And the same with the ear, just a little bit to the right hand side, just so I can get that lovely narrow feel uh, to it. So I want to make sure that I can get that. So again, make sure that you 
constantly check. Now this stage, this is what I call the drawing stage, you're kind of creating a foundation for your drawing. Now, like any foundations, like the foundations of our houses and our homes, we want those foundations to be strong because we want our houses to stay standing for as long as possible. Now, much like your drawing and your painting and any other type of art you're doing, you want to kind of create a strong foundation because you want your finished piece of artwork to be as strong as possible. So by investing a good amount of time into this very, very structural, this base foundation of your work, where all the other marks and all the tone is going to sit on, you're more likely to have a stronger outcome because you've created that strong starting process. And this is a very good way for those of you that are struggling with getting a likeness and achieving something that you're very, very happy with. This method is a really, really good way. And of course, this could be translated to any genre. It doesn't have to be portraiture. It could be um, other genres from still life and landscape. By investing this amount of time into getting something that you're really, really happy with and really comfortable, you're more likely to end up producing something that you're very, very happy with, hopefully something you're very, very pleased with, that you've, um, you've caught something of that subject. So I'm just checking now, just going back down to this chin which I might bring up a little bit later, on the outside of his collar here. And the shadow line just going under his chin there. I think that's a good starting point, which, um, which I can sort of go on to uh, roughly work onto my next stage. So there's elements of this that I'm fairly happy with. There are elements that I know that I'm going to need to change and modify, but this is what I'm going to sort of uh, finish this sort of drawing stage. Now I'm working on to the next stage, I'm going to sort of go into sort of blocking in those tones. But before I do that, I'm going to take a quick break. Now for me, a break is really important with your work, and you can ca I call them mini breaks. Every 10 or 15 minutes, I just sort of walk away from the work, and I focus my attention on something different. It might be another piece of work that I've done, it might be an art book, I might have a cup of tea, check my emails, and what that does, it just breaks your attention and that's a sort of way that you're absorbed in that process. When you come back to your piece of artwork, once you've taken that break, you'll notice some of those mistakes or those elements that you're not quite happy with because you've distanced yourself from it. Whereas suppose if you didn't have it, take a break, you'd be so engrossed you might miss some of those elements that are not quite working. So take a little break, walk away, and then when you come back to it, if you feel there are elements that need to be changed, you can change them before you sort of go back and putting in that tone.